In my previous video on Vaporwave, my focus was spent mostly on the genre's relationship with nostalgia and how the specific generations of listeners tend to shape that connection. There was a section at the end where I somewhat sloppily speculated on the future of Vaporwave, and in this video, I'd like to do that section more justice. My conclusion at the time, because I needed to keep it brief, was that Vaporwave was going to evolve into something different and hopeful due to the anxieties of the young-leaning audience who enjoy the genre. Climate anxiety is the big one, and it's no surprise that solar punk is a theme in some new Vaporwave albums. With that said, there's more to it than that, and I want to expand on this topic through the concept of music innovation. Firstly, music innovation can be limited by a particular genre of music, and this is very evident in what I like to call gimmick genres. Gimmick genres are types of music that are defined by a simple gimmick, and a particular song becomes categorized under that genre when it follows that gimmick. Two great examples of this are hardstyle and drum and bass. Hardstyle music just requires the kick at the drop and for the BPM to hover around a particular ballpark. Meanwhile, drum and bass has the, well, drums and bass. While there's room for innovation in both genres, changing up the sound of the hardstyle kick or playing around with the time signature of drum and bass music, this is still a limited range of flexibility since you're always held back by the requirement of having the hardstyle kick or the drum and bass drums. With that said, lack of innovation is not synonymous with bad music. I have plenty of songs from both genres in my collection, and it doesn't get old because I'm not chronically listening to one gimmick genre or the other. Rather, I'm in the mood for one sometimes, and that rotation makes it easier to enjoy without fatigue. The reason the phenomena of those two genres are related to Vaporwave is because Vaporwave almost limited itself to this realm of gimmick genre at its inception. The very first albums that sparked Vaporwave as a genre were all plunderphonic, and this brewed a lot of questions about the philosophies around making art. It took prominent music critics like Anthony Fantano a while to come around to the sound, because that first listen tends to leave an unsavory impression on some. With time though, Nasally Staccato changed his rating on the early Vaporwave album Floral Shop, but I don't think that's an indication he'll ever warm up to more experimental artists like Christ, with three T's, who take the meme concept of early Vaporwave so far that he's used Sonichu art for his album covers. The debate and critique Luigi Nintendo initially started on his first review of Floral Shop was about effort and art. If plunderphonics are just slowed down, chopped and screwed versions of music that already exists, which borderlines on copyright infringement, then is it even real music? Does it count as art despite not requiring a lot of effort? And while I'm absolutely biased as a Vaporwave enjoyer, I'd argue that art is still art even if it's perceivably low effort. But even if I'm willing to admit that, I don't think Vaporwave's original plunderphonic artists are. Ramona Xavier and Daniel LePayton, the artists behind Floral Shop and Eco Jams Volume 1 respectively, both seem to play the albums off as joke projects that weren't meant to be taken seriously or be deserving of critical acclaim. Maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but to me this comes off as cowardice. The artist version of posting a picture and captioning it, felt cute, I don't know, might delete later. They're both, as experimental artists, too afraid of being proud of their works in that moment in case they end up cringing at it in the future. And I'm not shaming them for this either. As someone who's been making videos for many years, I know what that feeling is like. I literally went through a burn or bust phase and made videos about that stance which will never see the light of day again because those opinions are so embarrassingly bad in hindsight. The difference here, however, is that my cringy videos aged poorly, but those experimental albums aged reasonably well. So well, in fact, that I'm sure it frustrates Ramona that an album she made when she was in her teens has basically overshadowed her entire career as an experimental music artist, since to many, she's just known as that one person who made Floral Shop. It's hard for any artist to live with the realization that they were only afforded that one-hit wonder, and it's unfortunately common in music. This frustration over one-hit wonder albums and embarrassment over early projects artists don't want to completely own up to meant people seldom took time to pontificate on the philosophy of plunderphonic vaporwave, especially once the genre evolved past that point. I think plunderphonics works so well because it takes a concept that's been around much longer than Vaporwave and genrefies it. At its core, a plunderphonic song is an already existing work interpreted through the artist's favorite sections, or as Lem Kuja puts it in his song Hollywood, their musical orgasms. Usually I, I try to follow my music orgasms and when I have a music orgasm that's when I know I need to sample something. Like, imagine you're listening to a song you enjoy a lot but you have that one part that you really like, to the point where you can't help but skip to it instead of listening to the whole song up until then. And if you're crazy enough, you think, fuck it, I'll just make an edit where this part loops. And if you're even crazier, you'll start to mess around with looping it in a way that doesn't sound repetitive and ends up creating a whole new song based on that one part you really like. This effect is the reason why I joke that a plunderphonic song is good when I enjoy the original music it samples, but great if I hate the original song. I know that in my previous Vaporwave video, I mentioned repetitively that many of my favorite Vaporwave songs gave me an appreciation for decades and genres of music I might not have found otherwise. 
but the fact that I sometimes genuinely dislike the original sample is evidence, at least to me anyways, that Plunderphonic songs are new songs. They're a valid artistic creation, even if the process is perceived as low effort. If this isn't enough for someone to feel less shameful about enjoying Plunderphonic music, let me also mention that artists have made Plunderphonic music way before the release of Floral Shop or Eco Jams in the early 2010s. And Mesh. And Mesh? Mesh? Yeah, Mesh. Mesh is an artist that's been around since 2001, and he's done Plunderphonics during some of the earliest parts of his career, and this isn't a happy coincidence either. Plenty of other genres in the vaporwave space have had some kind of historic backing. Another example some point to is how Burial's 2007 studio album Untrue influenced the microgenre of dream punk. My point with all this is that you don't have to feel bad about listening to niche genres like Plunderphonics or dream punk because you're afraid that it's just some childish modern music trend that you'll cringe at later, like that studded belt you thought was so cool in middle school. These are genres that have decades of history but just happen to have quickly developed very recently due to the internet and its waning discomfort with unique music. While some listeners are still enjoying Plunderphonic Vaporwave, I know I am, the genre quickly evolved from that point and blew up into tons of different micro-genres and projects like the aforementioned Dream Punk along with Future Funk, Signal Wave, Slush Wave, etc etc, and this opened up the Vaporwave space in music to a lot of innovation. A lot of that musical innovation came from Cat System Corp, who's a prominent artist in the scene for a good reason. He's responsible for popularizing and maturing the micro-genre of Molesoft. He gave a new vibe to the Vaporwave flavor of nostalgia through his fetishization of the concept of high riff, a longing for a place and time that didn't truly exist, and then solidified that concept with his album News at 11, where the point of it was to audibly experience Hyrith for a world in which the national trauma of 9-11 never happened. With all of this said, what does this have to do with the future of Vaporwave? While I briefly covered this topic in my previous video, I also mentioned that many are worried about whether or not Vaporwave is dead, and I do believe these two things are related. Vaporwave, similar to other projects such as VR, tend to have boom and bust periods. I'm nostalgic for when I got to enjoy VR before Facebook ruined Oculus, and VR chat before they banned modding. Similarly with Vaporwave, I have a longing for the times where Telepath was still doing Phaserwave. Cat Corp and Cultro were releasing some of their most prominent albums. The music group 2814 hadn't broken up, yet, and the record label Dream Catalog had yet to become controversial and depressing. <laughs> The people who think Vaporwave is dead tend to feel that way because these boom periods are behind them, and they're worried that we might not get another comeback like High Riff, New World, or Birth of a New Day. But that comeback isn't going to happen unless we analyze why the current Vaporwave environment isn't as exciting as it was during those booms, and this partially has to do with innovation. In some ways, Vaporwave became too complacent with how disposable its music felt, especially when people on YouTube were just taking random songs, slowing them down, adding reverb, and calling it Vaporwave. This increasing feeling of disposability as a factor of Vaporwave makes it easier for both artists and listeners to be blind to the Xerox effect in action, and it's reminiscent of how badly we wanted to move on from Vaporwave's plentiphonic stages without critically analyzing it. The Xerox effect is an inevitability of media that's produced by successive generations of creators. H. Bomber Guy explains this effect incredibly well in his video, The Killing Joke Movie and the Problem with Comics. The pattern goes like this. Some type of media, whether it be vaporwave albums or comic books, is made by a prominent first generation of creators. Portions of the audience who are enamored by these pieces of media are inspired to eventually make some of their own in the same genre. However, the problem here is that this second generation of creators end up making media that represents the aspects that stood out to them the most or fascinated them right away, and not the deeper tidbits of meaning that made the media special as a whole. In comics, this meant some second generation creators focused more on the beefy, over-the-top, extreme with an X character design, while ignoring the interpersonal functions that made that character more than just a flashy, eye-catching body. Oh, but it takes them an hour and a half to that, get into all of this stuff that's if right. they work fast. Do you draw listen. hands? Are you into hands? Oh, room? yeah, I'm the best. You do hands? In the same vein, a lot of new and unexciting Vaporwave focuses more on the standout features such as Plunderphonics, Downtempo, and Vague Nostalgia than the roleplay and various themes of the albums that made them so special. It can be harder for a listener to realize this, and there's a couple of reasons why. First is sample usage. Some would see it as an insult or unprofessional for a few Vaporwave and Future Funk albums to sample from some of the same songs Telepath and Infinity Frequencies did in albums that came years prior. People are already primed to be upset when this happens since this effect is genuinely annoying in the EDM scene. With that said, it's not universal that using the same sample material as another artist is a bad thing. In regards to Vaporwave, this effect isn't annoying since the original sampled song is used in different ways across 
across multiple albums to contribute to each one's own unique vibes. This, however, should only be the result of coincidence, and not the result of an artist's inability to venture out. It feels like some new creators are too afraid to find samples themselves, and think it's clever to sample songs from the same albums as other popular vaporwave artists, effectively scavenging from what was unused and left over. This is evidence that such new artists, despite their hearts being in the right place, don't understand why these specific albums were sampled from. As I said previously, the method of Plunder Phonics is about drawing from your memories of songs or moments of songs you really enjoyed. This doesn't have to mean pop music either. If you feel this way about music that's obscure and underappreciated, that makes for great samples too. On top of that, if you're considering making Signal Wave, I'm sure there are plenty of interesting and rare television commercials you remember from your childhood that you can sample from as well. Point being, I'd like to see artists recreate the process of drawing from their own memories of nostalgic music and media instead of copying from the homework of first generation artists to make it appear like they've gone through this process. There's a difference between copying from and recreating this particular vibe in the genre. Speaking of vibes, that's what pulls this all together. If you happen to be, as Cat System Court puts it, Sample Buddies, I mean, look at this goofball, of course he'd name it something silly like Sample Buddies. If you happen to be sample buddies with another artist despite going through this genuine process, that's not a stain on your creation. These similar samples will most likely contribute to albums that construct different vibes, making the sample usage unique in both creations. I understand that vibes is a very broad and unspecific term in the modern vernacular, so let me give a few examples to pin this down. Just like sample usage, it's easy for second-gen artists to miss important nuances by squinting their eyes and assuming that the vibe of all Vaporwave albums is the same 90s revivalism vague nostalgia trip every time. They miss the fact that the roleplay of a Vaporwave album makes it so special, and without this, the genre can start to sound disposable and uninspired. Admittedly, not all musical roleplay ages well, which could be another reason why second-generation artists are afraid of trying it themselves. For example, the album Worldwide from Dancing Fantasy starts its first track off like this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board our flight around the world with Dancing Fantasy. Lean back in your seat and fasten your headphones and let the music take you away. Yeah, cringe. I know. However, if you recognize the melody in the background of that snippet, that's because the track, along with a few others from that album, were sampled in Floral Shop, so the album isn't without its merits. Musical roleplay to create a vibe can come in many different forms. Some Mallsoft albums in the Geometric Lullaby catalog include a fake customer loyalty card, similar to those given out at some general stores, with the purchase of the vinyl copy. Other versions of this roleplay can be subtle, such as odd details added to the description of the album, cover art that alludes to the given theme, whether it be Utopian, Signal Wave, or Mallsoft, mysterious personas that shape listener experiences of an artist's discography, the addition of analog distortions like tape hiss and vinyl crackles, or the addition of television tidbits from the Weather Channel or otherwise. These are not a hodgepodge of ingredients one adds randomly at their discretion to make an album that sounds like Vaporwave. They're each chosen, sometimes in combination, to portray a specific vibe. You're not going to play Weather Channel tidbits in a Mallsoft album because it divides the listener in regards to what environment you're going for. It doesn't make sense to add record crackles and tape hiss in the same song, since that further confuses a listener about the environment in terms of the chronological setting. The point I'm making here is that creating Vaporwave music isn't about passing some threshold or bar. It's about artistic expression just like any other kind of music, and that requires something from inside you, along with a specific intent for each album to help you decide how you wish to express these personal tidbits across various albums and songs. Just as the Xerox effect isn't exclusive to Vaporwave, this problem isn't either. As a writer, I've learned that good writing requires something personal from me. It's why AI-generated articles will never be special, because forming a genuine analysis of something requires you to use how you feel about it to produce meaningful writings. Machine learning algorithms aren't supposed to have opinions or emotional experiences to draw from. They just process data. It doesn't get pissed off, it doesn't get happy, it doesn't get sad, it doesn't laugh at your jokes. It, it just, just runs programs. programs. And while the personal element is important in writing just as it is in music, so too is the intent. I have to have an intent with each essay I write to flow the ideas and feelings properly into essays so they'll make sense. While I ironically call myself eccentric rants, scripting out my thoughts like this is my favorite form of expression because I can lay out an intent and group these personal ingredients into their proper works. When I express myself conversationally outside of writing, it becomes harder to form this intent and my ideas flow all over the place into chaos. This is no different than an artist who's unaware of how they wish to structure their musical intent when they're working on an album. 
speaking of chaos, let's quickly recap before we continue. Vaporwave's infancy was spent as a gimmick genre, and once it evolved past that point into different subgenres and flavors, it opened itself up to musical innovation that made the albums it produced special and worth being the fuel for inspiration. This inspiration led a second generation of artists to start making Vaporwave music, but the consequence is that this isn't as exciting as the creations which came before it, since the philosophical nuances of the genre were lost on these new artists by accident. With these ideas established, I can talk about the future of Vaporwave and potential innovations in the genre. While I wasn't saying anything particularly incorrect in my last video where I claimed that one potential future for the genre is solar punk, I could have elaborated more on why this is the case, as it isn't entirely due to Gen Z's anxieties in regards to climate change. Solar punk, as a flavor of dream punk, exists because some artists are going in the direction of sample-free Vaporwave or venturing into ambient projects due to fears in regards to sampling and copyright. Times unfortunately change, and the samples artists used to get away with 10 years ago don't fly so easily in the modern day where platforms automatically scan uploaded content and copyright holders are more trigger happy with their DMCA claims. Cat System Corp himself admits this, adding that he especially has to worry about this since he now runs a record label. For an individual artist, copyright might not be a major threat, but as a label, this can keep you from getting a record pressed or get you into legal trouble since you're more likely to have the money to pay a settlement. While my opinion isn't going to change this fact, I don't exactly find this fair since sampling and resampling is prevalent in many genres of music, and frankly, artists should be more worried about streaming services, ticket seller monopolies, and shitty record labels fleecing them out of the money they deserve. I guarantee you that you're losing more money with these corporations than individuals sampling your content, but I know damn well it's easier to go after the small guy than the monopoly. Anyways, my mandatory bitching about copyright aside, solar punk exists because of this combination between a need for environmental utopianism and rebranding being needed to popularize sampling free vaporwave subgenres. It just happened to work out. I'm sure I've offended some by saying that Dream Punk and Solar Punk are vaporwave subgenres, but a lot of these things garner similar crowds. Cat System Corp is creating Dream Punk and ambient music these days, such as his album Building a Better World, that's just as much worth listening to as his old Mallsoft and Signal Wave albums because it still has the magic of a consistent vibe driven by clear creative intent. While many Dream Punk albums have a vibe of nighttime big city cyberpunk dystopia, it's well fitting for Hopeful Utopia to be a contrasting theme existing within the same genre. I'd consider this the first of the musical innovations within the vaporwave space since it gives more range to the themes of dream punk to keep it fresh and interesting. It provides a wider range of meaning to apply to new works. This next innovation hasn't been elaborated on much, but that doesn't mean it's without potential. While some vaporwave vibes like Mallsoft and 90s revivalism have been beaten to death, there are others that could be elaborated on further, and this is where the theme of Animoia or Hyrith comes in. News at 11 doesn't have to be the only album in which you feel nostalgia for a place that doesn't really exist. The magic of that album will be lost on younger generations, and that leaves a gap for further expressions of Hyrith to be made. For these people, their defining national trauma might be the COVID pandemic instead of 9-11, and I think that would be a great foundation for a Hyrith album adjacent to News at 11 that strikes at a similar longing to live in a less traumatized timeline. Not that I'm gushing over building a better world or anything. Ah, who am I kidding, I really love that album. But another reason it's so good, apart from having a clear artistic intent, is that it's one of the only modern Vaporwave adjacent albums I've seen that innovates on the Hyrith concept. Building a Better World is conscious of the fact that Hyrith does not specify past or future. The time that doesn't exist could be in either direction, and that's the string that connects Cat System Corp's previous works of Hyrith to his newest album, at time of recording. This is all further evidence that there is still room for innovation in this category, and future Hyrith, as opposed to past Hyrith, is another opening for second-gen artists to consider trying out. With Hyrith, there is the possibility of new national traumas to be remedied, and an entirely new category of time domain to reach out into, but we're still not done. The last opening in the concept of Hyrith is Frequency. As a little-known byproduct of the modern dystopia driven by late-stage capitalism, newer generations of people would tend to be nostalgic for more things and events with shorter time gaps between them. As tech companies which used to be a hopeful glimmer in the eyes of elder millennials begin to crash and burn one after the other, by the time young millennials, Gen Z and Gen Alpha grow up with those same corporations, their lives are no longer about beautiful vaporware tech promises, but instead about frequent longings for short-lived projects they used to enjoy. Older generations will tend to have nostalgia in low frequency with nostalgic events having ample time between them. Meanwhile, a younger person embodies a high-frequency nostalgia, or hyper-nostalgia, in which they have a longing for the early internet, pre-Elon Twitter, phones with headphone jacks, games that weren't $70, YouTube's golden years, or school snow days that had yet to be robbed from them by remote education. The things that are now dying in this fast, decaying world were once something that defined a meaningful portion of a person's life. Like anything else of that importance, its disappearance triggers nostalgia all the same. 
So, to drive the future of Vaporwave on the positive side, I recommend new artists to try some of the following. Rediscover the process of celebrating your favorite music through Plunder Phonics. Decide on and commit to a clear intent or vibe for the album. Express a personal hyrith as a potential album intent. When discussing these points, I use the term positive side specifically because musical innovation isn't just about seeing room for improvement through untapped possibilities, it's also about acknowledging how we could get rid of the things that detract from a better experience. Improvement through removal instead of addition, if you will. Thankfully, there's only one major area I identify within this category of things that detract from the experience, and it's related to dystopian fiction. Like a lot of what I've already discussed in this video, it's another thing people don't always fully understand. When complaining about the current reality, I've seen people grumble about how we're not in the cool dystopia, where everything is gritty in a badass way. The world is drenched in neon pastels, and the ongoing destruction is entertaining instead of depressing. However, dystopian fiction doesn't exist to promise you anything. It's not vaporware, but rather a compromise in search of catharsis. It exists because living in dystopia kneecaps one's ability to turn to pure utopian escapism as a coping mechanism, and by adding this nugget of realism, the dystopia theme, it allows daydream-flavored escapism to be more accessible. One could argue that this is no different than the hypothesis Mark Fisher states in Capitalist Realism, where he believes that the same effect happens in the case of trying to imagine a world without capitalism. Living in a shitty system, whether that be dystopia or capitalism, makes it harder to imagine living outside of it, and that puts people in a trap where they either believe it's inescapable, or believe that utopian daydreaming is too unrealistic and thus not useful. The understanding they lack is that the dystopian element is not there to make the escapism better, but to make it more palatable for people stuck in this trap of realism. Despite this, some lean more on this element of compromise so the goals of fiction don't feel so vaporous. And this is basically an admission of defeat since such a lack of fiction eventually starts to emulate the very thing it was meant to escape from. It becomes a reminder of dystopia instead of a relief from it. I'm allowed to complain about at least one dystopian record label today. Their name starts with a D, they have a huge catalog, and it's DMT Tapes Florida. They're an embodiment of the issues I just described in regards to believing dystopian fiction needs to be more realistic. On the surface, they seem impressive. Vaporwave's largest music label, with over a thousand albums? That's pretty impressive. However, just a little bit of scrolling and you realize why this is all just marketing. Yep, that's an entire catalog full of shitty AI-generated album covers, shitty AI-generated music, and artists I promise you I have never heard of. Saying you're the biggest digital vaporwave label because you AI-generated a thousand albums is like saying you're a celebrity because you're using bot accounts. Big isn't about quantity, it's about influence. Getting back to the AI-generated content, this was going to be an inevitability of tech bros that have such a hard-on for the Web 3.0 Tony Stark Epic Bacon 420 AI future bullshit. And while my analysis of it could end there, this inevitability has an interesting detrimental effect on Vaporwave. This genre is already starting to feel disposable because of a lack of direction and innovation with many recent albums, but this basically piles it on by making the music so disposable it's literally digital garbage. When you release a thousand albums, people might give it a listen, but then they move on and pay it no attention. They don't talk about it, they don't mention how it was there during a vulnerable period in their lives, they just listen once and move on. It's still there, it's still being hosted on the internet, but it's effectively been thrown away, disposed of. It's the pinnacle of the definition of disposable music. This record label is depressing because it's creating music that reminds people of the dystopia other artists are trying to get us to ignore out of comfort. It's kicking Vaporwave fans when they're already down because this only adds on to the pile of things that convinces them that Vaporwave is dead, that it isn't special anymore, and I'd hate to see such an audience be robbed of that sentimental feeling. By no means am I trying to imply that Vaporwave fans are infantile. This is a community where people can feel comfortable admitting that standout albums like Birth of a New Day were there for them during their roughest days, and to be loyal to such a genre only to see it devolve into meaningless disposable music that demonstrates its incapabilities of recreating that magic would hurt even the strongest of people. Disposable, mass-generated AI music isn't the only thing that's detracting from people's ability to enjoy Vaporwave as an escape from dystopia. While DMT Tapes Florida is serving as an uncomfortable reminder of the realities of AI art, the Vapor Vinyl community is starting to experience how their hobby is beginning to remind them of the financial realities of dystopia. Yes, I'm asking you to be empathetic for vinyl collectors, but bear with me here because they're canary in the coal mine for a larger issue. Anyways, the Vapor Vinyl community is starting to become aware of the fact that collecting these days is immensely different than it was just a few years back. 
Usually, albums were pressed because they were well-loved and popular amongst fans. This meant that new pressings were announced maybe every few months, and this made each one feel special since it gave people time to get hyped about them. Nowadays, the community is realizing that not only has the cost of vinyl gone up dramatically, but there are new pressings of albums damn near weekly, and this includes albums they flat out never heard of. Even in the Bandcamp Friday Hall thread it's on Reddit, people are admitting that they can't keep up with all the releases and are limiting what they buy. This shift is revealing how collecting vapor vinyl is being pushed from hobbyism to consumerism. It's also making vinyl collectors suspicious of how damn near anything can get a pressing, and that makes it harder for them to collect everything they want and record labels to get through their product stack reliably. By no means am I saying that lesser known or niche albums don't deserve pressings, record labels are free to decide to press whatever they want, but this is reflective of that same lack of direction and intent in the creation of vaporwave music spreading to how we treat the physical media associated with it. Vaporwave isn't just about the sound, it's about the vibe and the roleplay. In a similar vein, vinyl isn't primarily about the sound either, but the experience. There's something special about being able to hold the music, the large cover art, the ritual of taking the record out and playing it. It makes an album feel more special when you have to go through these inconveniences compared to just clicking play on a computer. But even if the record has a cool design and comes with nice artwork, none of that window dressing matters anymore if it's for an album that doesn't feel meaningful. Vaporwave albums that feel disposable and mass-produced due to lack of direction or innovation are one thing, but pressing all those uninspiring albums to vinyl is just salt in the wound. While I'm sure this is not done intentionally out of malice, it just serves as another reminder of how Vaporwave feels like it's dying, and how hobbies, like everything else, are becoming too expensive for people to enjoy the way they want to. While discussing this all, I'm sure some of you are going to misconstrue my bluntness as an attempt to paint the artists and labels who embody these issues as the villains that killed Vaporwave. This can't be further from the point. Vaporwave is just a concept, and you can't kill a concept. Rather, you might stray away from it or fail to properly commit to it. I'm not angry about where Vaporwave has currently ended up, just disappointed. If I cannot contribute to fixing it due to my lack of ability to make music, the best contribution I can make is an analysis of its current problems and where there's room to improve, and that can be hard to do without coming off like a bit of a pretentious asshole. Appreciating good art, whether it be music or a nice photograph, may feel natural, but explaining why is complicated. Centering the subject in certain aesthetically pleasing sections of a photo shoot feels natural, but explaining why requires discussing the rule of thirds. Putting together themes and samples to make a good song can also feel natural, but explaining why that feels so satisfying requires the same level of pretentiousness. I get into the weeds as a way to make us conscious of the details of good art that might not come to everyone naturally. People are aware that there's a problem with modern vaporwave, but I don't want them to wander aimlessly worried about whether any of their attempts are in the right direction. Really, I can only hope that an artist or someone important will see this and take some of my critiques to heart so they can feel more confident in making something they can feel genuinely proud of. As silly as it sounds, I've been a free artistic consultant for a vaporwave album by the artist Time called 2019. Sure, it's not perfect, and my involvement was limited due to this all happening over Reddit DMs, but it was fun to be part of a project like this, and I'd be happy to do it again if another artist wants to get in touch. Vaporwave needs philosophy. The duo that made up the music group 2814 would reveal in social media posts and interviews how much they cared about philosophy and history along with their fantastical music theories such as the format being an objective, divine language of the universe. Cat System Corp has done the same in demonstrating how his fascination with abstract philosophy surrounding Hyrath have driven the intent of many of his albums. These are artists who have made genre-defining albums, and they're worthy of that praise because they're made with intriguing philosophies in mind. Vaporwave might very well continue to decay. Maybe it'll be lucky enough to have another winner of an album, or better yet, regain its bearings and take better hold of the magic that made it feel so special during its best years. Frankly, I'm bad at speculation. The only things I can be certain won't happen in the genre's future are that telepathic and fragmented memories will never get a vinyl box set, we'll never get another collab album on the same level as fragmented memories, 2814 and Culture won't release any new albums, and Vectroid won't make any more music under the Macintosh Plus persona. And if I'm wrong about any of those, I'll eat my shirt and be out a lot of money.